The Gormenghast Trilogy by Mervyn Peake Book One Titus Groan The Great Kitchen As Flay passed through the servants' archway and descended the twelve steps that led into the main corridor of the kitchen quarters, he became aware of an acute transformation of mood. The solitude of Mr. Rotcod's sanctum, which had been lingering in his mind, was violated. Here, among the stone passages, were all the symptoms of ribald excitement. Mr. Flay hunched his bony shoulders and with his hands in his jacket pockets dragged them to the front so that only the black cloth divided his clenched fists. The material was stretched as though it would split at the small of his back. He stared mirthlessly to right and left and then advanced, his long, spidery legs cracking as he shouldered his way through a heaving group of menials. They were guffawing at each other coarsely, and one of them, evidently the wit, was contorting his face, as pliable as putty, into shapes that appeared to be independent of his skull, if indeed he had a skull beneath that elastic flesh. Mr. Flay pushed past. The corridor was alive. Clusters of aproned figures mixed and disengaged. Some were singing, some were arguing, and some were draped against the wall, quite silent from the exhaustion, their hands dangling from their wrists or flapping stupidly to the beat of some kitchen catch song. The clamour was pitiless. Technically, this was more the spirit which Flay liked to see, or at all events thought to be more appropriate to the occasion. Rotcod's lack of enthusiasm had shocked him, and here, at any rate, the traditional observance of Felicity at the birth of an heir to Gormenghast was being observed. But it would have been impossible for him to show any signs of enthusiasm himself when surrounded by it in others. As he moved along the crowded corridor and passed in turn the dark passages that led to the slaughterhouse with its stench of fresh blood, the bakeries with their sweet loaves, and the stairs that led down to the wine vaults and the underground network of the castle cellars, he felt a certain satisfaction at seeing how many of the roisterers staggered outside to let him pass, for his station as retainer-in-chief to his lordship was commanding, and his sour mouth and the frown that had made a permanent nest upon his jutting forehead were a warning. It was not often that Flay approved of happiness in others. He saw in happiness the seeds of independence, and in independence the seeds of revolt. But on an occasion such as this it was different. For the spirit of convention was being rigorously adhered to, and in between his ribs Mr. Flay experienced twinges of pleasure. He had come to where, on his left, and halfway along the servants' corridor, the heavy wooden doors of the great kitchen stood ajar. Ahead of him, narrowing in dark perspective, for there were no windows, the rest of the corridor stretched silently away. It had no doors on either side, and at the far end it was terminated by a wall of flints. This useless passage was, as might be supposed, usually deserted, but Mr. Flay noticed that several figures were lying stretched in the shadows. At the same time he was momentarily deafened by a great bellowing and clattering and stamping. As Mr. Flay entered the great kitchen, the steaming, airless concentration of a ghastly heat struck him. He felt that his body had received a blow. Not only was the normal, sickening atmosphere of the kitchen augmented by the sun's rays streaming into the room at various points through the high windows, but in the riot of the festivities, the fires had been banked dangerously. But Mr. Flay realised that it was right that this should be as insufferable as it was. He even realised that the four grillers who were forcing joint after joint between the metal doors with their clumsy boots until the ovens began to give under the immoderate strain were in key with the legitimate temper of the occasion. The fact that they had no idea what they were doing or why they were doing it was irrelevant. The Countess had given birth. Was this a moment for rational behaviour? The walls of the vast room, which were streaming with candid moisture, were built with grey slabs of stone and were the personal concern of a company of eighteen men known as the Grey Scrubbers. It had been their privilege on reaching adolescence to discover that, being the sons of their fathers, their careers had been arranged for them, and that stretching ahead of them lay their identical lives, consisting of an unimaginative if praiseworthy duty. This was to restore, each morning to the great grey floor in the lofty walls of the kitchen, a stainless complexion. On every day of the year from three hours before daybreak until about eleven o'clock, when the scaffolding and ladders became a hindrance to the cooks, 
the grey scrubbers fulfilled their hereditary calling. Through the character of their trade, their arms had become unusually powerful, and when they let their huge hands hang loosely at their sides, there was more than an echo of the simian. Coarse as these men appeared, they were an integral part of the great kitchen. Without the grey scrubbers, something very earthy, very heavy, very real would be missing to any sociologist searching in that steaming room for the complexion of a circle of temperaments, a gamut of the lower human values. Through daily proximity to the great slabs of stone, the faces of the grey scrubbers had become like slabs themselves. There was no expression whatever upon the eighteen faces, unless the lack of expression is in itself an expression. They were simply slabs that the grey scrubbers spoke from occasionally, stared from incessantly, heard with hardly ever. They were traditionally deaf. The eyes were there, small and flat as coins, and the colour of the walls themselves, as though during the long hours of professional staring the grey stone had at last reflected itself indelibly once and for all. Yes, the eyes were there, thirty-six of them, and the eighteen noses were there, and the lines of the mouths that resembled the harsh cracks that divided the stone slabs, they were there too. Although nothing physical was missing from any one of their eighteen faces, yet it would be impossible to perceive the faintest sign of animation, and even if a basin full of their features had been shaken together, and if each feature had been picked out at random and stuck upon some dummy head of wax at any capricious spot or angle, it would have made no difference, for even the most fantastic, the most ingenious of arrangements could not have tempted into life a design whose component parts were dead. In all, counting the ears, which on occasion may be monstrously expressive, the one hundred and eight features were unable at the best of times to muster between them, individually or taken en masse, the faintest shadow of anything that might hint at the workings of what lay beneath. Having watched the excitement developing around them in the great kitchen, and being unable to comprehend what it was all about for lack of hearing, they had up to that last hour or two been unable to enter into that festive spirit which had attacked the very heart and bowels of the kitchen staff. But here and now, on this day of days, cognizant at last of the arrival of the new lord, the eighteen grey scrubbers were lying side by side upon the flagstones beneath the great table, dead drunk to a man. They had done honour to the occasion, and were out of the picture, having been rolled under the table one by one like so many barrels of ale, as indeed they were. Through the clamour of the voices in the great kitchen that rose and fell, that changed tempo and lingered until a strident rush or a wheezy slide of sound came to a new pause, only to be shattered by a hideous croak of laughter, or a thrilled whisper, or a clearing of some coarse throat. Through all this thick and interwoven skein of bedlam, ponderous snoring of the grey scrubbers had continued a recognisable theme of dolorous persistence. In favour of the grey scrubbers, it must be said that it was not until the walls and floor of the kitchen were shining from their exertions that they attacked the bungs as though unweaned, but it was not only they who had succumbed. The same unquestionable proof of loyalty could be observed in no less than forty members of the kitchen, who, like the grey scrubbers, recognising the bottle as the true medium through which to externalise their affections for the family of grown, were seeing visions and dreaming dreams. Mr. Flay, wiping away with the back of his claw-like hand the perspiration that had already gathered on his brow, allowed his eyes to remain a moment on the inert and foreshortened bodies of the inebriate grey scrubbers. Their heads were towards him and were cropped to a gun-grey stubble. Beneath the table a shadow had roosted, and the rest of their bodies, receding in parallel lines, were soon devoured in the darkness. At first glance he had been reminded of nothing so much as a row of curled-up hedgehogs, and it was some time before he realised that he was regarding a line of prickly skulls. When he had satisfied himself on this point, his eyes travelled sourly around the great kitchen. Everything was confusion, but behind the flux of the shifting figures and the temporary chaos of overturned mixing tables, of the floor littered with stock pots, basting pans, broken bowls and dishes and oddments of food, Mr. Flay could see the main fixtures in the room and keep them in his mind as a means of reference, for the kitchen swam before his eyes in a clammy mist. 
divided by the heavy stone wall in which was situated a hatch of strong timber was the garde manger with its stacks of cold meat and hanging carcasses, and on the inside of the wall, the spit. On a fixed table running along the length of the wall were huge bowls capable of holding 50 portions. The stockpots were perpetually simmering, having boiled over, and the floor about them was a mess of sepia fluid and eggshells that had been floating in the pots for the purpose of clearing the soup. The sawdust that was spread neatly over the floor each morning was by now kicked into heaps and soaked in the splashings of wine, and where scattered about the floor little blobs of fat had been rolled or trodden in, the sawdust stuck to them, giving them the appearance of rizzles. Hanging along the dripping walls were rows of sticking knives and steels, boning knives, skinning knives and two-handed cleavers, and beneath them a twelve-foot by nine-foot chopping block, cross-hatched and hollowed by decades of long wounds. On the other side of the room, to Mr. Flay's left, a capacious, enormous copper, a row of ovens, and a narrow doorway acted as his landmarks. The doors of the ovens were flying wide, and acid flames were leaping dangerously, as the fat that had been thrown into the fires bubbled and stank. Mr. Flay was in two minds. He hated what he saw, for of all the rooms in the castle it was the kitchen he detested most, and for a very real reason, and yet a thrill in his scarecrow body made him aware of how right it all was. He could not, of course, analyse his feelings, nor would the idea have occurred to him, but he was so much a part and parcel of Gormenghast that he could instinctively tell when the essence of its tradition was running in a true channel, powerfully and with no deviation. But the fact that Mr. Flay appreciated, as from the profoundest of motives, the vulgarity of the great kitchen in no way mitigated his contempt for the figures he saw before him as individuals. As he looked from one to the other, the satisfaction which he had at first experienced in seeing them collectively gave way to a detestation as he observed them piecemeal. A prodigious twisted beam warped into a spiral, floated or so it seemed in the haze, across the breadth of the great kitchen, here and there along its undersurface, iron hooks were screwed into its grain. Slung over it like sacks half filled with sawdust, so absolutely lifeless they appeared, were two pastry cooks, an ancient croissonnier, a routier with legs so bandy as to describe a rugged circle, a red-headed legumier, and five sorciers with their green scarves around their necks. One of them, near the far end from where Flay stood, twitched a little, but apart from this all was stillness. They were very happy. Mr. Flay took a few paces and the atmosphere closed around him. He had stood by the door unobserved, but now as he came forward, a roisterer leaping suddenly into the air caught hold of one of the hooks in the dark beam above them. He was suspended by one arm, a cretinous little man with a face of concentrated impudence. He must have possessed a strength out of all proportions to his size, for with the weight of his body hanging on the end of one arm, he yet drew himself up so that his head reached the level of the iron hook. As Mr. Flay passed beneath, the dwarf, twisting himself upside down with incredible speed, coiled his legs around the twisted beam and dropping the rest of himself vertically with his face a few inches from that of Mr. Flay, grinned at him grotesquely with his head upside down before Flay could do anything save come to an abrupt halt. The dwarf had then swung himself onto the beam again and was running along it on all fours with the agility more likely to be found in jungles than in kitchens. A prodigious bellow outvoicing all cacophony caused him to turn his head away from the dwarf. Away to his left, in the shade of a supporting pillar, he could make out the vague, unmistakable shape of what had really been at the back of his brain like a tumour, ever since he had entered the great kitchen. <laughs>